that again. Let's do it. Okay, so this talk is about supercharge your service mesh with eBPF. Um, so my name is Edith Levine. I'm the founder and CEO of Solo.io. I'm Yuval Kohavi. I'm the chief architect at Solo.io. And we're going to teach you a little bit about uh, eBPF, service mesh, and how they're related together. Before that, I'm just going to say that me and Yuval are both working in Solo.io. Um, Solo is focusing on application network connectivity. And we have a lot of people, we focusing our stack is basically focused on Envoy and STO. And therefore, we are working very, very hard with customers and upstream. So we have a lot of TOC members. Some of them are here even today. And, 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 and we're basically working to make service mesh upstream better for our customers. So that's number one. And we will start. So let's start when we're talking about eBPF. We'll start talking about the kernel. I know this is something that you're usually not talking about in a service mesh con, but we should. So let's talk about the, the Linux kernel one second. And what you can see is that based on this architecture, which honestly, it's a little bit simplifies, it's pretty complex. And it's also very mature, right? So I mean, if you think about it, the work that we're doing today and the thing that we're running today in production is most likely was upstream between 10 to 10 years ago to maybe two years ago. But honestly, that was done way on the back, way on the back before we started DevOps and before we started doing evolution, right? And before there were a lot of, you know, we're running everything right now as code and cloud native, but still we're running it on the same operating system that is honestly was built for application that was running 10 years ago. Very, very hard to do innovation in, 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 Unicur in, a, in, a, in the kernel. And that's where eBPF is coming into place. So what is eBPF? So eBPF basically started, BPF basically started in, uh, you know, as the opportunity to solve that problem, which is very hard to innovate in the kernel, and basically started in the TCP dump. And the idea was, can we create a sandbox or some extension or plugin to the kernel mod that will be injected by the user mod to the kernel mod, and basically will be able to run there on it when they will want. So what the advantage of it, first of all, it will give you a lot of flexibility. It has to be safe, right? It's running on kernel mod. We need to make sure that it's not going to take your operating system down. And it needs to be fast because, you know, we need performance there. So that is extremely important. And as I said, they started by basically putting the, B, the BPF in the TCP dump. So honestly, if you're using TCP dump, you're probably using it every day. That's where it started. But then they said, that's pretty cool and pretty unique. What if we will extend that? And that's exactly what, it, what eBPF stands for, extended BPF. What if we will extend it and basically we'll have this ability of that technology, which is kind of like the sandbag box, basically being hooked to event in the kernel. So what you can see here, you can put in user mode, you're basically writing the program, right? And what you can see is that index, you know, on the kernel itself, when there is an event, you can hook this code that you wrote and basically execute it. And that's exactly what is the idea with eBPF. So the idea is, again, create, bring innovation to the operating system, bring the ability to give you customization and solve some problem way quicker than upstream. So now you will tell you a little bit about why it's relevant to Kubernetes. Yeah, so a quick background to Kubernetes and networking, right? So with Kubernetes, there's obviously the Kube API server, and then on each node, you have the kubelet, essentially the Kubernetes agent. It has a container random interface. That's what um, runs your container, essentially Docker, container D nowadays, cryo. And on the networking side, you have what's called the CNI, the container network interface, and that's the component that implements the Kubernetes networking layer. So Kubernetes networking is pluggable and swappable. There are various implementations uh, for Kubernetes networking, and the CNI is the plugin interface that uh, you need to implement to add network to Kubernetes. So the CNI responsibility is all the communication between pods, IPs, and how they uh, communicate with each other. In addition, there's another component called kuproxy, whose role is to make sure that uh, pods can talk to Kubernetes services. So services has virtual IPs in the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and these IPs, uh, in order to map back to the pods that back them, this is managed by kuproxy. 
Now, originally, crew proxy was implemented, uh, it was basically a user mode proxy written in Go. Obviously, that wasn't uh, very fast. Uh, so then they updated the implementation to an IP tables based implementation. So you can imagine here, each pod have an IP, and if the front end wants to access the back end through a kube service, the, the pod one, the front end pod, only access a single IP, and kube proxy load balances it to all the back end pods, right? So in this case, it'll be two back end pods uh, that kube proxy needs to worry about. And why are we talking about all of this? Uh, the, the way IP tables work, IP table was originally created for firewalls. And you had the very basic things that a firewall needs to do. Uh, it wasn't at this scale of Kubernetes with a lot of uh, services, right? Uh, and the way IP table is implemented, it's a list of rules, and this list needs to be executed one by one. So the more services you have, the more pods you have, uh, the less it scales, right? Because that, that list grows linearly and you need to go through those rules one by one to implement, essentially reach your backend service. Now, the way eBPF solves this is instead of using IP tables, we can use eBPF here to do that mapping between a virtual service IP and backing pod IPs. And as you can see from this graph, we can do it sort of in a constant time, whereas with IP tables and coup proxy, it goes linearly higher the more services we have. Now, the project that brings all these eBPF advantages into Kubernetes is called Cilium. And Cilium, if you remember, we discussed about the CNI and coup proxy. Cilium is an implementation for both using eBPF. So Cilium can create for you the networking layer and also replace Coop proxy and uses eBPF to bring this scalability, the security and the networking features uh, using eBPF to Kubernetes. So things like uh, service identity to create network policies, uh, things like uh, performances we just discussed, things like encryption, multi-cluster routing. Uh, so just as an illustration, you can see here that, you know, with Cilium, you can express policies using the pod labels and selectors and making it easier and scalable. Uh, and this is another example of comparing, you know, the rules that would be in IP tables with core proxy versus what you can do with eBPF and Cilium and, and use pod selection. Now, as far as... Uh, Envoy is concerned. Envoy is the key data plane component in the service mesh. Uh, Envoy also can uh, benefit from eBPF advantages. So, for example, with eBPF, we can short circuit the TCP stack between the application and the sidecar, right? So, when your service sends a request, normally uh, IP tables is used to reroute the request transparently through Envoy. But that means that it needs to go through the entire TCP stack for the app, get to the kernel, th and get back into Envoy. Uh, with Cilium, with eBPF, we can use a feature called SockMap to essentially take the data from one socket and put it straight in another socket, shortcutting the whole uh, TCP dump and optimizing that. Uh, in addition, Envoy also uses eBPF uh, in its Quick implementation. Uh, if you're not aware, Quick is HTTP3. It's the new next level protocol. It's uh, UDP based. There's no kernel implementation yet. So Envoy uh, uses eBPF to teach the kernel how it should route uh, the, the Quick packets into the Envoy worker threads. Uh, all right, with that, I'll bring it back to Edith to talk a little bit about Itzio. Yes. So, you know, we're looking at Cilium, right? You just heard about how amazing it is and what we can do with this and how, how the performance will be better and so on. And you can go to the website and you can see that basically there's some similarity between what it's doing and what Service Mesh is doing, right? I mean, they're talking about networking here. They are talking about observability and they are talking about security, which is exactly what I took from the STO website. So are they competing? Are they complementary? What's going on there? And that's basically what we wanted to check a look at. And we did. So basically, we did this research, which is basically 
STL versus psyllium. And we took basically those three sections and we tried to understand where it makes sense to use one, where does it make sense to use the other, and where does it make sense to collaborate between those two. And that's exactly what we did. So for instance, if you're looking at identity, uh, actually I will let you talk about it, talk about it. <laughs> so when we compare the, these features, uh, Cilium versus Itzia, so with identity, the Cilium identity is on the L4, uh, L3, L4 level. It's based on pod labels, whereas with Itzio, it's cryptographic identity. Um, if you're familiar with SPIF, uh, essentially mutual TLS uh, certificates, uh, that's, uh, and the source of the identity is the service account associated with a pod, not the pod labels. As far as uh, network policies, so you can create uh, Kubernetes network policies with Cilium, uh, again, uh, layer three, layer four level. Uh, and in addition, Cilium have their uh, Cilium ETO implementation where they allow you to create L7 policies with Go-based filters. With ETO, you, all the policies are implemented using Envoy uh, without eBPF. You can have WASM extensions, which gives you a lot of power in expressing your custom policies. And it also supports things like external auth and has an Envoy filter CRD that you can really customize what you need to get out of the Envoy. As far as encryption, uh, Cilium offers encryption between nodes, uh, whereas Itzio offers MTLS between sidecars. Uh, as far as uh, networking, in, in load balancing, Cilium is, again, Cilium mainly is the L3, L4 level, so you have pair connection load balancing, where Itzio on the L7 can give you pair request load balancing. Uh, as far as resiliency, if you're using uh, the L7 uh, Cilium with Envoy, you have retries. Itzio exposes more of the Envoy features, outlier detection, retries, fault injection, and with Envoy filter, you can really customize it and essentially use any Android feature you want. Uh, in terms of multi-cluster, Cilium uh, implements a flat network, a multi-cluster kind of mesh that uh, joins multiple clusters together. With Itzio, there's various ways to do it. Uh, you can use Itzio with a flat network, but Itzio does not implement a flat network because Itzio is not on that level, on the L3 level. Uh, but what you can do with ETO is, and something that we see a lot that organizations actually prefer to do, is use ingress and egress gateway to connect clusters together. In terms of observability, uh, Cilium offers Hubble. It sits on the Cilium agent on every node, collects metrics. Uh, and it's your, your, again, Envoy. Uh, with ETO, you can customize the metrics Envoy exposes, again, using uh, WASM. Uh, access log, uh, with Cilium you have the L7 Envoy uh, implementation. Using Go filters, you can create custom access logs per protocol. So if you have your own custom protocol, you can create a Go filter for it and create some access logs for that. With Itzio, you can use the Envoy filter CRD to add access logs uh, to your sidecars. Uh, service graph, Cilium uses Hubble, uh, Itzio uses Kiali. They take the metrics, the traces, and create a service graph for you. Cool. Thank you. So then the question is, what can we do about it? Because if you know Solo well, you know that we are not just doing a research. We usually act on that finding. So what did we find and what did we do? So as I said, I mean, I think I will talk about it really quick, but in the nutshell, we have a product, Glue Mesh. Glue Mesh is built for different, um, um, now five different uh, um, extension. We, it's based on STO. We have a lot of custom filter for Envoy there, and therefore we can do a lot of stuff in the ingress, in the API gateway, as well as the service mesh, uh, uh, STO. And we have developer portal, and we have an extension with Wasm. And now we have also GraphQL, as we announced in the keynote before. Um, so again, I will go about that. But what is interesting here, what do we want to do with it? Right? And I will tell you what we decided to do with this. So as you know, as we explain right now, there is layer three, it's Cilium is mainly focused on layer three and layer four. This is where it is, they're on the node, this is what they know, it's very local. SDL is more like layer four to layer seven. So what we did, we basically said, look, when someone telling us, right, in our product, in our global API, in, in, in the Glue Mesh API, I do not want this container to talk to this container, 
We can do it in STO, like we're doing it so far, right? The translation loop and putting a CRD. But we can also put it in Cilium and basically create these things, locks in the, all of those layers. So basically what we decided is, honestly, to ship Cilium with our product, make sure that if it's there, we're discovering it, and we're taking advantage of him being there. Everything that's related to observability, you know, we can give you way more metrics, way more stuff that STO cannot give you. So both of them is amazing. What we're doing with STO today is basically managing, you know, installing, upgrading, life cycle, and so on. We do the same thing with Cilium. Um, in terms of networking, honestly, most of the stuff there is make more sense to use. Layer 7 make more sense to use with STO. So, you know, retriers and all this stuff, it's actually make way more sense to use with, with STO. When we're talking about security and policy, we can leverage again both of them, right? And that's exactly what will happen. So basically, when you ask us, I don't know, I want this observability, we will go and translate it to a CRD of STO. And if you have there an interesting a CRD of Cilium, collect the data, make sure that it's all forced for you, upgrade, install, and so on. So that's what we're doing. Hopefully, you like it. Um, Check it out, and I don't think I even have an end uh, slide, so I think we're done.